So yesterday someone commented that the question and answer was too long. I agree. Yesterday was too long. <laughs> it's such a weird thing. Like, I felt like maybe I'll be able to cover everyone. <laughs> so it's like, I wanted to bring it to perfection that no one has any questions. Ridiculous. I mean, not perfection as such, but in the sense, like, get all of the questions out of the way. But we probably could have gone all night. Yeah. And we still have enough. So that was too long. And we'll just do half an hour at the end. Do you want it up, honey? Oh, yeah, maybe that's Thank you. Great. So we do half an hour at the end. And now I was so far, so far, I've answered really basically every question. So maybe I try to be a little bit more selective in some questions that seem so general. At least I try to bring it back to the topic itself so that we're not all over the place. Okay, so from now on, more focused on the mind. Okay, all right. So, oh, yeah, so direct perception. The process of cultivating a direct realization. Not direct perception, but direct realization. So, as we've heard, the wisdom aspect in Buddhism is extremely important um, in order for us to eliminate what's in the way to becoming liberated or even fully enlightened. For that, we need a yogic direct perceiver directly realizing emptiness. And every time it manifests in a practitioner's continuum, it irreversibly eliminates one of the layers of afflictive and then thereafter cognitive obstructions. Okay. In general, there are five different awarenesses, a presentation of which elucidates the stages of the gradual process of cultivating a yogic direct perceiver. First is wrong consciousness. We start off with a wrong perception that we ha have had since beginning this time. So wrong consciousness. And then at some point we may actually doubt that wrong apprehension in dependence on someone giving a teaching on it, us reading a book about it, someone making a comment, whatever are the causes for us suddenly doubting Or us just suddenly, I don't know, maybe sitting down, starting to reflect upon how things appear and whether that accords with reality, and that leads to doubt, just that analysis or whatever is the cause. And then slowly that doubt, that doubt, um, what, what, what kind of doubt do we start off with? Of the three types of doubt, tending away from the fact, equal doubt, and tending towards the fact. Away from the fact. Away from the fact. Away from the fact. And then... But depends what the fact is. Well, whatever is the fact, like whatever is reality, so we have a wrong view about it first. So it meant, meant, meant we were not in accordance with the fact. We actually, fact means reality, right? So whatever is the fact, whatever we misperceived previously with a wrong view, now slowly if we move away from that, are we more tending towards the non-fact that we used to apprehend when we had the wrong view, right? When we had the wrong view, we were... <coughs> wrong view means we were holding on to something that did not accord with reality. That was not a fact. So now our doubt is most likely to be a doubt that moves away from the fact. And then... Equal. equal. Maybe, maybe not. And then towards the fact. I mean, not in all cases. Of course, you may even jump through some... But in general, it's likely that we have that tendency. All right, then correctly assuming consciousness, correctly assuming, and then comes the inferential cognizer. And thereafter, direct perception. So that will now be, be explained. In particular, with regards to the things that we need to know in order not to suffer. Subtle impermanence, emptiness, etc. Before we meet the Dharma, we do not have any correct consciousnesses with regard to, the, to emptiness. So when I say before we meet the Dharma, and some people may argue, well, yeah, but I had already some sense of emptiness before, before I met the Dharma. I'm not talking about just this life. I'm not talking about just this lifetime. I don't know. I think you have to encounter some spiritual system to just come up with that on your own may be difficult, and even if it was in a previous life. I mean, even the Buddha himself was someone who in a previous life, of course, had done a lot of work, had done a lot of practice to be then the Buddha in that particular life. 
So therefore, at some point, you do need to meet the Dharma, I mean, teachings that lead you in the right directions, because we naturally, instinctively have a wrong view of reality. We innately have a wrong view. So we do not have any correct consciousnesses with regard to emptiness or even any doubt. We only have wrong consciousnesses that is intellectually acquired or innate ignorance that apprehend intrinsic existence. Now that's new. Intellectually acquired or innate. What is the difference? Intellectually acquired and innate. There are two types of misapprehension. Not just with regard to emptiness. Any misapprehension that you may hold, and it's explained as we go along, but might as well just say it now. I've, any misapprehension we have, it's, there are two types. One is innate or inborn, and the other one is culturally or intellectually acquired. Culturally, philosophically, usually the term they use is intellectually acquired, but that means basically depending on our culture, depending on our upbringing, on the philosophy we follow, we may have intellectually acquired wrong views. What, what, what could you think of, like with regard to the self? Yes. Uh, innate example of innate could be permanence. Pa- uh, an innate sense of permanence. And what would be an intellectually acquired sense of inherent, permanence? Inherent existence. No, no. No, take the same object, the same object that you misapprehend. With regard to the self, for instance. Take the example of an inborn sense of wrong sense of a self. What would that be? Something we're born with. I'm not going to die. With regard to the self. No, no, that's the sense of permanence, not so much with the self. Right? Oh, he was, yes. No, no, this innate sense, yeah, well, maybe I'm not going to die. Of course, that's still with permanence. But let's just take the self. All right? So with regard to the self, uh, a sense of inherent existence, uh, a sense that there's a separate entity, it's a little coarser then. It's not exactly getting at inherent existence, but it arises from that innate sense that phenomena exist inherently. So a sense there's a controller mind that controls mind and body. We have this innate sense. We're born with that. And then there's an intellectually, there are intellectually acquired wrong views which based on our innate sense that there's a separate self gives rise to culturally, philosophically, uh, intellectually acquired other views that built upon that first view. Can you think of something? Soul. Oh God. God. Soul. Soul. A soul. The idea of a soul. The idea of an overarching kind of universal self. What else? What else? Let, let's... Pardon? Identity of ourselves. Like our, what we are good at, what we are bad at. But that's not a wrong view. That is important. That is an important sense of identity which doesn't necessarily deal with the exaggerated self. When you're just looking, I'm good at that, I'm not good at that, you're not necessarily exaggerating. You're just labeling, I'm good at that because your mind is good at that. I'm good at that because your body is good at that. That doesn't necessarily imply you're exaggerating the self. So the soul is already a good example. The overarching self is a good example. Think of other things. There's a self that exists independently of the aggregates. We don't have an innate sense of that, but we may develop that. What did you say? Nihilism, that nothing exists after this life and this is it. Nihilism. Nihilism, yes. So nihilism as in like intellectually acquired. But how do you come from like an extreme of reification of like believing in something permanent, in something, in something inherent there? True and intellectually acquired. Because you're not able to prove that uh, it's either that it's permanent and I'm not agreeing with it, that means it doesn't exist. It's okay, but that's not really building upon that. That's just going into another extreme. You could kind of cite that, but it's really like, it's more like you take your initial wrong view and based on that, you add a little bit, right? You add a little bit, like with the soul. You have an innate sense there's something there, so you create a whole religious idea of a soul but that's kind of more what I mean of course you're right of course eventually you, that may happen that you fall into the extreme of nihilism maybe okay. up like the uh, material material reduction is like the brain yes very good material reduction the I the person is just the brain so there's a sense there's something separate something solid there oh there's the brain that's 
something solid, <laughs> seems pretty solid. So that's the person, for instance, to, uh, to think along those lines. Yes? Like cars for race would be built off the sense of self, so like you think that you're a certain way because of your car or that's actually a really interesting idea. I mean, especially with, with regard to caste. Less so with race, because we label race on the basis of possibly a physical appearance, right? But caste, there's nothing there that makes a person, unless, of course, you've been reborn in the same caste over and over, there's like you only marry within, so that may, ta- may result in looking slightly differently, right? If people always marry within a certain caste and always stay within that caste, that could lead to biology, biological differences, which accounts for saying, oh, this person must belong to this caste. But oftentimes, just... Ca- I mean, like, where is that found? The person is a Brahmin or is a... Pardon? It's No, no, that's the, you're, oh, that's the history. That, that's different. No. But saying, what is the basis of imputation? Something in that body or mind that makes that person this, that, or the other. We have to go to the parents because they belong to that. But there's really, it's very difficult within the basis of imputation that is mind and body to find something that says this person is of this caste, for instance. Mm-hmm. Or like, you know, we have caste system in the West in a different way, classes, right? We do, I mean, in Germany, it's, it exists. Unfortunately, it's there. Um, it's there that you only kind of, you're with, with certain people with a certain education, a certain background, you don't interact with other people. But, well, here in this case, again, like, what makes me think, there's nothing of their body and mind, maybe the way they talk, and maybe, okay, there may be some differences in the way they express themselves. But, you know, speaking slightly differently, having different interests, that may be, but it's not necessarily. Okay, so with this caste, it's kind of just created by the mind to distinguish between people, and that's based on the innate sense there is something there from the side of the person, and then it gives rise to a sense, okay, so there's really something there, which of course can't be found, that there are real differences. But I'm thinking of something that Freud, for instance, talked of. That tribalism and sense of other... Ego. Ego. Ego and... Super Super ego. ego. (laughs) Ego and super ego, right? He expressed this idea of ego and super ego. And again, what is that ego, super ego? So that's an intellectually quiet sense of an I, right? That is based again on our sense that there is something separate. So that's intellectually quiet versus innate, all right? And the whole, I mean, in the West, we foster that all the time. Maybe I mentioned this before that this century is called the century of the self. Well, this, this term was coined in dependence on, I don't know where it came from, to be honest, but there's a documentary, a four-part documentary. So you asked me before, of my, you asked me about my favorite, or someone asked me about my favorite documentary. I'm not sure it's my favorite, but it's one of my favorites. I really like that. It's a four-part documentary called the century of the self. It, destri- it describes how in this century, in the previous century, it started in the 20th century, with, uh, with one of the nephews, I believe, of Sigmund Freud, or maybe it was a grandson. No, was it the nephew? Okay, great, thanks. So it was the nephew of Sigmund Freud who figured that if we bring in the ego into kind of advertisement and, you know... Yeah. So then you can manipulate people in a very effective way. And that kind of started that whole movement about, right, like be special, drink Coke. I mean, I'm just kind of whether that's really what they say. But this kind of, I remember seeing this commercial about this guy being so special. He took a helicopter to the store to take out a bottle of Coke. He was kind of taken through the roof and took a beautiful woman on the way back, you know, <laughs> took her back up and just, that was, he was so into it. Oh, Marlboro man. Do you all remember the Marlboro Man, right? The guy on his horse, freedom, rugged, rugged, kind of like living as he liked, well, living the life, kind of on his own with his Marlboros, right? <laughs> Died of lung cancer, right? No one knows. <laughs> right? So this idea, now you're no longer allowed to show commercials, but when I grew up, well, yeah, Camel, Marlboro, everywhere. And again, 
you were special, you were independent, and all that. In in order to that, that wish to be special, to be to to stick out. No, what's the word? Not stick out. Stand, stand out. Stand out. To stand out because that's. I mean, we don't want to be. We don't want to be. What's the word? We don't want to be ordinary. Well, it depends on the culture. I mean, some cultures you really want to be ordinary. You want to be part of the crowd, right? But in the West, it, it kind of developed into that. That is so interesting. When you watch that documentary, you come to understand a little bit about your own views that are actually influenced by that. And one of the first steps to work with them um, is to recognize them. And I believe a lot of loneliness in the West is a result of that, feeling lonely, feeling isolated. First, there's the feeling of isolation and loneliness, and that then leads you to act accordingly. You feel isolated. If you feel like you're part of everyone, you're part of the human family, then whoever you meet, right, it's just like you, you start a conversation, you start chatting with them, you don't feel isolated. When other people do well, when you witness this, like you watch TV and you're, oh, they did so well. You're rejoicing in their success. So it's not like, oh, they're doing well. They're over there. I'm over here. Loneliness is so amazing. Amazing in the sense that it's so painful and so unnecessary and very much grows of our uh, exaggerated sense of individualism that we have in the West, but also, of course, when I say West, I include India, because it's the Western way of life now. For the last 50 years, I don't know whether it's that long, but, you know, for quite a few centuries now, India Indians live the Western style of life. So that brings that in us, in us like this sense of self, the sense of being different from others, not being ordinary, standing out. And the side effect of that leads to standing out, being separate, I'm alone. Okay? So, so much loneliness. I don't get that here so much, but again and again, the homeless start talking about this now, about loneliness in the West. The degree of loneliness that people experience in the modern world, I should say, not in the West, but in the modern world. Again, as an artificial, intellectually acquired misperception of separateness, which then, when we're unhappy, in those moments when we suffer, it leads to a sense of loneliness. And here, Buddhism can help us so profoundly understanding interdependence. We're part of the human family. We're not alone. We're affecting others. They affect us. Their success is our success. My success is their success. My happiness depends on theirs. Theirs depend on mine. Therefore, their happiness is as important as mine. And even if I can't actively go out and work for their benefit, I wish them to be as happy as I want to be myself. Then this divide between me and the others, that divide that's never really existed, that, that I created, that, my, that was, was reinforced by that lonely mind. So there's a sense of separation first. That leads to a lonely mind. That lonely mind reinforces that. Okay, and it's like we're trapped in that vicious circle. Okay, so it's very important, therefore, to learn to learn to identify with the happiness of others, to deeply rejoice. You can be on your own. We all know being physically alone doesn't mean you're lonely. A lot of people feel much more lonely when they're in a crowd of people. Okay? When they can't participate, when they can't... But again, just be happy that others participate. Why, why, why can we not learn to feel happy that everyone else is so happy in the crowd? And we just witness them, even without contributing, as in like cracking a joke or being extremely, I don't know, witted, wit, witty, right? Like making witty comments, etc. Like, never mind, just enjoy that they do it and enjoy the conversation, even just listening in. So if we learn that, the sense of loneliness can disappear, and it's so draining. Of course, maybe there's no one here who's ever felt lonely, so I'm just talking. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, <laughs> all of us may have felt lonely at some point in time. And it's, it's, when I say it's not necessary, it sounds bizarre, but it's based on a wrong perception of reality. And all we need to do is understand a little better about how we 
we are just labeled. I is merely labeled from the perspective of this mind. But the, you are I from your perspective, and it's we, right, all together. All right. And you know, this is the idea that we label I on just one person. Well, that is not necessarily always the case. There are people who label, who, for whom the I includes more than just this. For instance, parents. When they have a child, now they don't refer to the child as I, but it, they might as well, because that's how they feel. This child they have is part of me. There's a sense that parents apparently have what I know, but you know, <laughs> from what I kind of observed over the years, um, I've been fascinated by mothers. It went to such a degree when my, when my siblings had their nephews and nieces, like their kids, they thought I wanted to be, be, have a child because I was asking so many questions. <laughs> they were like, ooh, finally she's giving up that funny thing. What is it? <laughs> You know, a Tibetan family, they'd be so, they'd be so shocked their child is like, in my family, it was the other way around. They were waiting for that. So, <laughs> so but basically, they, yeah, I was, I was asking them a question, what is it like? They were all, like, they all had their kids around the same time. So when they just had that baby, I was like, wow, they could be as selfish as it gets. Like, one of my brothers, he did all these risky things, like doing this crazy ride bikes, like cycle bikes or motorbike rides or... I don't know, these crazy hikes that could potentially, you know, result in an accident. But once he had his little girl, he stopped it. Because his little girl needed a father. So now it was all about this little girl. Suddenly she took over. So my brother's I included this girl now. In fact, that was his most important part. And his mother was exactly the same. The mother was the same. So there was a sense of like an extension of the I, Right? And then the more children you have, the greater this extension, right? Five children, six children. And so you have a sense that that's part of you, your I. And of course, your love grows. It's not even you divide it. You don't spread it thin, you know, like a, like a, like a pancake. The more you roll it out, the thinner it gets. No, no it equally, you have the same love for all. It's fascinating. So that also proves we can love other people equally, right? So I, I told you the story many times when I made that faux pas one time. I, I, like one time someone told me about this, this mother who had lost a child but had five left. And I was like, well, she's got five left. <laughs> <laughs> Not realizing, right? I was like, can't be that bad. You know, it's kind of like, it's almost like your love is so spread thin that it's like, that was kind of my, my logic. You know, like you have five cars, you have six cars, you lose one, you still have five. <laughs> I know, I know, this is just... This is just someone not knowing. I didn't say it to her. I, kind of said, I, just, I said it to someone else, and I, I, I was careful about it. I said, like, yeah, but she still has five, you know? So it's like, right? I mean, how, I mean it's bad, yeah, but... Of course, it, it makes a difference if it's your only child, of course, but no, the love is equal, and if one di you have only one child and one dies, now I realize that the love of parents for their children is it, not spread thin, it's just as strong, your love for each individual child is just as strong uh, as it is if you just have one. So that is for me proof of the Buddhist idea that our love can grow towards all sentient beings, we can love all sentient beings, but also the fact that you consider that to be a part of you. You consider that person to be part of you, so that's like the I expands, basically. All right. So therefore, if you have a sense all sentient beings are part of you, that it's not like the I is here and my happiness is here, but that everyone is just a part of you, it's just an extension of yourself. Then, of course, you naturally would want to work for their welfare. You naturally rejoice in their success. Envy is only a sign that you see them as separate. Why would you envy their success if this person is part of you? P parents don't envy their children's success. No, sometimes. But usually, usually, I mean, sometimes you hear, like, some, sometimes there may be a little bit of envy, but usually there's not, right? Usually there's not. It has to be something very specific, but usually, of course, the parents rejoice in their children's success. So all we need to learn 
is to develop the sense everyone is a part of me. Everyone is a part of me. And then when people do really well, you can so deeply rejoice. Right? You know, we have this terrible tendency. Gossip is like that. Like we hear someone has a, has a bad quality and we're like, yeah, yeah, let's talk about it. <laughs> let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Why? Because we, we, we do that. Why? Because um, we, we talk about this because it kind of like gives us the feeling our own negative qualities are not that bad. It's just, yeah, stroking the ego. Yeah, in the sense like, oh, let's talk about their negative qualities because mine are not that bad. But actually we should be concerned when other people talk about their negative qualities. Oh, no, no, but recognize their good qualities, right? See, don't don't misunderstand them because the moment we start talking about another person's bad quality, it's very difficult for others to also see that they have good qualities. So to mention... Oh, but they have this quality that's really good and that's really that gives a much more balanced picture, right? So this is what we need to learn because it just causes suffering. And to rejoice in the good qualities of others, to praise others, to be really happy when you hear about someone doing really well and to go, oh, how lovely, right? Not to be jealous or envious because you're not that person. No, May I become like that and to praise that quality. And it gives you some happiness. It gives you happiness to say, oh, wow, this person is so lovely. She does so well. And other people, they're, they're really happy to hear that, actually. Unless they're envious. <laughs> and they pretend they're happy. <laughs> but usually, you know, if they don't know that, people are happy about the good qualities in other people. And it's nice to talk about them. So we can, of course, say, look, there is this quality in this other person. I find that difficult to cope with. That's all right to say that, but I think it's important to then also point out their positive qualities. Very important. Also to the other person. Because that's how our mind works. We go into extremes. When someone talks about person X, let's take David, so a person X having certain qualities, negative qualities, the other person does not have the opportunity... Oh, there's a David. I don't want to say anything about David. He's amazing. There's the David, the, the, one of the teachers here. Okay, I let go of David. Um, Tashi, no. That's a Tibetan name. I don't want to use a Tibetan name. Tashi. There is a Tashi here. Okay, no, no, no. All right, let me know. No, no. Uh, John. Is anyone called John? Uh, how about Oswald? Oswald. <laughs> All right, let's take Oswald. Could be a girl, too. Anyway, Oswald. Okay, Oswald. Oswald. So let's take Oswald. So, I can hardly say it. So, <laughs> Oswald has a lot of negative qualities, right? Possibly, as we do too. And then if we talk about Oswald to another person, it's just not fair because they don't get a complete picture of this person because the good ones we don't mention. And also what is so important, if you want to criticize another person for their sake, all right? Have you ever noticed if you criticize someone and you say to them, well, you've done made this and this, you have made that fault, for instance, what happens? What happens to you if someone criticizes you? You feel misunderstood. As in like, they're only pointing at your, your fault, but they don't understand what's behind it. You don't, they don't see your good qualities. So you become, become very defensive because you feel misunderstood. If that's not the whole picture, which is why I feel very strongly, if you really want to point out something to someone, first you tell them what you admire in them. You know, tell them, look, Actually, I always wanted to, to let you know you're doing such... And there's always something, right? There's always something that we see that we like about them. And even if we... Well, we need to find out if there's something, right? <laughs> even if we don't see it, but I'm pretty, much, I'm pretty sure we can. And to kind of see, look, I really like that. I wanted to let you know that I like that. Anyway, before we criticize someone, we usually know them a little bit. We don't get to walk around, know them for five minutes and start criticizing them. <laughs> so usually when we point, want to point something out, and it comes oftentimes from a good place. What did I say? Like, for instance, in my own... Oh, no, I didn't say that here. But in my own case, of course, if I have... I have lots of faults, but I'm not aware of them oftentimes. I'm in denial of them, or I believe others don't notice. <laughs> I'm good enough at hiding them. So, <laughs> so therefore, 
actually in my hearts of hearts I wish other people would tell me it's not like I'm going to be terribly pleased when they do but in retrospect like after a while I'd be like wow thank you actually <laughs> right so it's not initially something I like to hear but in actuality I want to know because otherwise how can I change uh, if I don't know other people are aware of my faults <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, so then with other people they feel the same way, which is why it's important to tell other people if we really care for them, but to be super careful, to be really gentle, right? And to make sure we're not angry with that person. I mentioned that before because if it's bothered us all the time, it's always made us angry. The moment we talk about it, we go back into that pattern of being angry with them as we talk about it and that's not advisable. So only when we can see it with care and compassion, those faults, and then also recognize the positive qualities. And first say, look, there's this, 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 this um, that I appreciate about you, etc. There's one thing I noticed. If you're kind of like a clever, you say like, but never mind. And usually like, what is it, what is it? <laughs> they ask you, because of course you describe them in a way that felt understood. And then to become kind of perfect, it's not, it's maybe something they like to be, as in like, you know, they, you've seen their positive qualities. And then you say, there's just one thing I notice. And then they probably ask, what is that? And they actually ask you. So then you can kind of say it, right? <laughs> but very gently and very understanding. And also say that you do understand, but that may be misunderstood, etc. I think that's a skillful way where you don't fall into the extreme of just seeing the negative. Does that make sense? So it's all part of what we learn here. I mean, you may think, how does that relate to what is the mind? But it has all to do with that, as in like not falling into an extreme that someone is just bad or someone is just positive or negative, not falling into extreme that others are separate from myself, right? So it, it all has to do with that. We're all connected. If we label I as in like my happiness... Is important and we include other people first of all there's no sense of loneliness but also when we see things in other people just look at the whole person see them with their good qualities that will keep us from being angry in fact you cannot be angry with someone have you ever had that feeling like you're really angry with someone like really really angry and you're like I'm so angry and then someone comes along and tells you something positive about the person and you're like don't tell me this I can't be angry at all this I'm really angry about them don't tell me this right it almost like feels like good to be so angry and if I now tell them they're actually Mother Teresa in disguise well it can no longer be angry so you see our anger doesn't work if we try to think of some positive aspect of that person, we just cannot, right? You hear about a, you hear about a, a serial killer or a politician, what have you, uh, done something terrible, and then you hear some about good qualities that they have, and you can no longer have that same sense of hatred, right? Mm. Mm. Or you understand the causes and conditions that give rise to it. Go ahead. Hitler, people say he was a vegetarian. It doesn't make me feel better. About it. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> but he was a vegetarian because he farted a lot when he ate meat. So I'm not sure that was the right reason. I mean, he had like. He loved dogs. So he loved dogs. Okay, so he was kind to, to his dog. Okay, all right. So, yeah, but I mean. That doesn't mean, but the hatred, you know, like this hatred of seeing someone as just like a devil. I'm talking about the hatred. I'm not talking about not being, like, pro I mean, judge, well, judging in the sense of like wanting him to be punished. Of course, it never happened. We couldn't do that. But the point is like this sense of hatred. The, 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 the stronger our hatred, the more our sense this person is only negative. Okay? And that's, I, I think, what's what's negative. Hitler is a bit difficult, especially me, for me to say that to someone who's not German. So let's leave Hitler out for now. <laughs> let's take Trump. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure the guy is kind of nice in some ways. <laughs> yeah. He said something really nice the other day. What did he say? He said he didn't want to attack Iraq. <laughs> right, listen. I like that. You didn't hear the news, I hope, because you're not supposed to have phones. 
Don't give yourself away that you just. It's not Iraq, Iran. Iraq, Iran. Iran. Oh, Iran, sorry. Iran. I, I, yeah, I mixed those two up. What did he say? There's this interview where he said he was going to attack Iran. And then suddenly, because there was this unmanned drone that was shot down, the American, so no one got killed. And then he said, like, he suddenly had that thought, and he said, how many people will get killed if we attack? And he asked one of the generals, and the general said, well, sorry, we need to come back to you. We don't know right now. We need to kind of calculate how many people could get killed. He came back and said 150. And then he said, well, 150, that's not worth it. Let's not do it. I don't know, there's probably more behind it. But just the fact that he, and he was criticized for it, they were like, well, what, 149 be acceptable? 100 would be acceptable? No, but just the fact that he did that calculation and he kind of, I kind of like that. Okay, let's not go into politics. Let's not get into politics. Okay, I don't know, I don't know they got men and I'm not sure. No, you have a good Trump example? Yes, I've met a guy who worked in his health course. Mm-hmm. And he said his son was doing like a fundraiser, mm-hmm. and like he was like he was in the back for some reason, and like in private he saw like Donald Trump and his son, and he was like hugged his son, was, like well done, and, like, good, 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 good. Mm-hmm. and like he saw it, but he wasn't supposed to be there. Okay. So that side of him, of course, like loving his child, etc. So things are a little less complicated. They're less, less simple than we may imagine. Okay. Sorry, this is going off in a, in a different direction. But I still, I still want to stress that we need to look at our own mind. Do we have deep resentment, deep hatred towards a person? Do we rejoice in their suffering? And we have a problem really have a problem. That's the kind of hatred. So just to avoid that, not to say that what people have done is not totally wrong, but that everyone has Buddha nature, of course, also the potential to become a Buddha eventually, I think is also important to remember. Okay, anyway, let's go back to this here. Sorry. Um, so first we have intellectually acquired wrong views or innate wrong views in the case of apprehending intrinsic existence. Well, then when we listen to teachings on emptiness, we begin to consider the possibility that phenomena do not exist the way they appear. At first, we generate doubt that tends away from the fact, thinking that phenomena probably exist intrinsically. By continuing to reflect on emptiness, our initial doubt transforms into equal doubt and eventually into doubt that tends towards the fact. With further contemplation, our doubt then gradually becomes a correctly assuming consciousness that correctly believes or is convinced of the emptiness of intrinsic existence. At this stage, we do not realize emptiness and therefore have to depend on correct reasoning. By listening, contemplating and meditating on the reasons that establish phenomena's emptiness, we eventually generate an inferential cognizer that for the first time incontrovertibly knows that phenomena lack intrinsic existence. So the reasonings that help us, so usually there are signs or correct reasons that are easier to comprehend than emptiness itself, and that then allow us to infer that emptiness must therefore exist, or that phenomena cannot exist inherently. Nonetheless, this realization is not enough, for it is only an intellectual understanding. Hence, we should engage in further intense, prolonged meditation on emptiness in order to deepen our experience, to really get an experience, a deep experience. At the same time, we also need to generate calm abiding. So in order to have a deeper realization that experiences emptiness, what we need to generate is calm abiding. Because that deep understanding only arises when we're very focused. If we're too distracted, this understanding cannot be deep enough. It will always be very superficial. So at the same time, we have to leave aside emptiness and take other objects to mind, such as the breath or the Buddha, the image of the Buddha, for example, focusing on that in order to now develop a certain degree of concentration. As explained above, calm abiding is achieved when we're able to continuously... Was that mentioned above? No. I'm, I'm wondering, there's, because there's... because I spoke about it, that's true. But there's some parts missing. There's some parts missing, because I... Yeah, yeah. Ah, le, that's right. That's where it was. But there, anyway, some things, even in the charts, I'm pretty sure it was in there, 
But sometimes yeah. with the printing, it gets. We left out the yogic direct yes, I know. explanation. Maybe it was there. Yes, thing. yes, that part was there. That's right about the image of the four hours. Mm-hmm. But anyway, never mind. As explained above, calm abiding is achieved when we're able to continuously focus on the image of the Buddha, of the Buddha, for instance, as one object of concentration for at least four hours, mm-hmm. while at the same time mm-hmm. achieve a special mental and physical pliancy. You can focus on an image for four hours, but there's a type of pliancy. Does everyone know what the word pliancy means? Like a kind of flexibility, a mental flexibility. Right now, our mind is a little stiff. We cannot willingly take on this object and that object. It's almost like, of course, our mind is not a physical object that is stiff like our body, but there's kind of a mental stiffness. Like your body, when it's no longer stiff, you can do with it whatever you want. You move it this way, you move it that way, you don't have any pain, and you can comfortably do that. Um, With the mind, right now, our mind, if you say, I want to meditate now, and then you sit down and you're ugh, and you get up again, right? So you're you're lacking that kind of flexibility. And this mental pliancy goes along with a sense of deep joy. So there's a sense of joy. Like, you know, when you're flexible and you start flexing your body, there's a sense of well-being and feeling relaxed, right? When you do yoga, but you don't do it for the first time. (laughs) When you do it for the first time, it's like, oh my God. (laughs) Oh, you be not flexible. That's exactly... (laughs) So anyway, don't don't get up. I'll just do this. Um, Pardon? Is there a towel? Yeah. Oh, okay, maybe a towel would be better. Donate. I can still read your question, so no worries. <laughs> I smell funny now. Do you have a treat? So there's no, there's no pliancy on my side. <laughs> Throw things around. Thanks very much. You can dry them. Yeah, you can dry them. Thanks. All right, so anyway, with regard to this pliancy, like even with physical pliancy, if you do a little bit of yoga every day, so you may feel slightly stiff, but the moment you start moving, your mind becomes relaxed, like your body becomes relaxed. And it's almost like a blissful kind of sensation, depending on, well, depending on many factors. But likewise with your mind, you can make your mind more flexible through concentration, such that you attain what's called this mental pliancy, which goes along with this with the feeling of bliss. And that was explained before. Maybe it's explained here, I don't remember now. But anyway, so it's not just the concentration, thanks, uh, Dusi. Yeah, I didn't want to try. Okay. Um, so it's not just the concent- it's not just that you're focused and you have great clarity, but you can do with your mind now whatever you want. Whatever you focus the mind on, it'll remain there. And there's some sense of well-being. That's really important. However, to come to that special mental and physical pliancy, so even the physical pliancy sets in. Okay, So not through exercise, but what happens is you can sit as long as you want. Through this calm abiding, what happens is your mind becomes so pliant and that gives rise to a kind of energy which now pervades your body and allows your body to sit without any ache without any aches, without any pain. So this is interesting because sometimes when you experience pain in meditation, it is not necessarily that there is some gross physical kind of problem. It's more that energies get blocked. They can get blocked. So you suddenly get this pain in your back. Okay, And when you focus on it, you focus on it for long enough, it may actually be released. And suddenly it's gone. And we have a lot of those pains sometimes. Suddenly there's like an ache there. If a doctor were to check it, you can't find anything because there's no coarse physical basis for it. It's only blocked energy. Right? So this is through meditation. If you do that, the blocked energies in your body are released oftentimes. So when you have pain in your shoulders, sometimes it's because of the energy your muscles cram together. But in other cases, that may not be the case. So you have pain. Um, and a lot of it can be released, like through, for instance, um, what do you call acupuncture. it? Sikup? Acupuncture, yeah. Acupuncture, the, the, the Tibetans call it sikup. So acupuncture, through acupuncture, um, you release those, those blocked energies. So that's a very interesting idea. 
Through meditation, you can actually work with the energy in your body and be more flexible, be more pliable, if you like. More flexible, that's probably a better word. Okay. However, initially, we have to alternate to come to that calm abiding and bring that together with our understanding of something. We need to initially... So this is what we try to do here, actually. Not only do we want to be focused, but we want to bring our understanding, mm -hmm. our analytical mind together with, with calmness. So that sounds a little bizarre because usually our analytical mind is distracted, if you like, because we go from here to there. Analysis means we are going back and forth between objects, which seems to be in contradiction to calm abiding. But you can <coughs> analyze in a very subtle fashion and still be single-pointedly focused. So they describe that Your mind becomes like a fish that's underneath the water. The water is your mind in general. The, the mind is first still, and your analytical faculty is moving like a little tiny fish underneath the surface without disturbing the surface. Right? So you can actually develop that kind of analysis that we don't have right now, but just with a very calm mind, slightly analyze. That's the kind of mind you want to get, to understand emptiness, to reflect on emptiness, but with this very focused, very still mind. We have no experience of that right now. Either our mind is still, or we're analyzing. Or we, well, we analyze all the time. In fact, we analyze, this is also something I want to stress. Why do we use reasoning? Because that's how our mind works. We are reasoning all the time. We are reasoning all the time. We never get angry without a reason. We say that, but we don't. Have you ever noticed? If I say something abusive to any one of you, you won't get angry right away. Right? You may be smiling at me, and I say something, and your smile slowly fades. <laughs> Why? Because slowly the mind starts thinking. Why? They have no right to say that. Why does she say that? I didn't do anything. Reason, 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 reason. And then we end up being angry. So we use reasoning at all times. It's very interesting. So therefore, this is how our mind works. That's why we now use reasoning as a tool not to give rise to anger and attachment. But also the reasoning we use is not correct reasoning. The reasoning we use is oftentimes exaggerated. For instance, attachment. Why are we attached to someone? We're not right away attached to anyone. It's not like when we meet a person, we're right away attached. No, they give us happiness, they give us some satisfaction, they make us feel better about ourselves, they bring the best out in ourselves. We have all these reasons, and we feel like this only comes from the other person. It's not like we can actually give that ourselves. No, there's a total dependence on that person, so we become attached to them. So we use reasoning, and that leads us to attachment. But it's exaggerated reasoning. It's not reasoning that accords with reality. And the other day I listened to a very interesting program. It was talking about why mindfulness helps depression. How does mindfulness help depression? Of just focusing on one object. And the explanation they gave was this. They said, when you are depressed, depression takes a while to set in. It doesn't just come without a reason. You reason. Okay? You, can in, you, you, you start reasoning, you start think, seeing things in a certain way, and your mind goes round and round, and in the end, it, you end up being depressed. And now you're trying to get out of this automatically, and your mind goes round and round, and you get caught in these, what do they use it? Like a, you get caught in the cycle of ever repeating similar kind of, and you can't get out of it. And that's all there is, and you get deeper into the depression. If it's, it sounded like, you know, you, you get caught in a net, and instead of slowly getting to, you keep moving further, 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 and you get more and more into the net. While mindfulness takes people away from that constant kind of habit they get into, just quietening the mind, calming the mind, and giving a bit of a distance to that. That was an interesting explanation. I don't know whether this is true for any kind of depression, but it shows to me that we do reason all the time. But if our reasoning is slightly off, it gives rise to slightly off other ideas, which then result in emotion. So exaggerated reasoning, exaggerated views of ourselves and others, 
I'm totally separate from others, it's exaggerated, and that gives rise to exaggerated responses. So reasoning gives rise to our emotions. Reasoning gives rise to our emotions. Like, we never get angry without a reason. That's why we use so much analysis in Buddhism. We use reasoning again, because reasoning gives rise to emotions. It gives rise to anger, to attachment, to envy, to loneliness, to fear, right? To depression, even, depending on the type of reasoning. And we just need to be a little bit off, a little bit over the top, and the emotion will be over the top. It will be an exaggerated kind of emotion. So, therefore, it's not about reasoning just for the sake of reasoning. No, this is a profound reason with regard to our psychological makeup. Now we use reasoning that is adjusted. Okay? So instead of having attachment, we generate love. Instead of generating the wish, may the other person make me happy, I generate the wish, may I make this other person happy. Instead of generating jealousy, I generate a strong sense of competitiveness. They are wonderful the way they do. How wonderful I rejoice in them. I'll try to be just as good. That's healthy. That's healthy competitiveness. Not, not being, being able to, being happy for their success, but feeling inspired to achieve the same. That's great. Okay? That's not exaggerated. So everything, what we're doing is just replacing the exaggerated reasoning with reasoning that accords with reality and end up with the emotions that actually benefit us. Okay? That's why all the reasoning stuff. So people get upset. They're like oftentimes saying, well, Buddhism is about reasoning. My head is already so full. I just don't want to reason any further. But that's not about adding more. So you have the the warped reasoning and the correct reasoning and your head explodes. No, you let go of the warped reasoning or you, you, you replace it, kind of like you empty your mind through mindfulness, for instance. So you, you create a distance. You're no longer that attached to your reasoning. You, you, you no longer, you create a new habit of just letting go through mindfulness, just watching and experiencing. And then gently you bring in this other reasoning, gently. Right? And then you have a, the reward will be feeling better. Maybe generating love and acceptance for yourself. That motivates you. Oh, I want to do more of that. And again, you go back. And slowly, through analysis, that's why analytical meditation is so important. You can't force love and compassion. You can't be angry without reasoning, wrong reasoning. You can't be. It doesn't just arise. There's always some form of dialogue. Yeah? Someone bothering you, you're just feeling crappy or whatever it is, there's always a reason for you getting angry. So, so important. Don't ignore analytical meditation. That's, I think, I feel very strongly about this. And here, of course, it talks about reasoning as a method to understanding reality, that is emptiness. And of course, then remove these disruptive emotions for good. So what we are dealing with right now is a temporary measure, a temporary solution, a band-aid, but that's still important because with that we prepare the way for a more final solution. All right. So therefore we apply reasoning and then an inferential cognition arises and then slowly we generate uh, calm abiding. Okay. And now we alternate. So once we have a correct understanding of reality with a sense of, with, with some concentration and now to make our understanding of emptiness even more focused because we're up against a very powerful mind that is grasping at inherent existence, we need to cultivate a very forceful antidote. And that is only a mind that is very clear and very stable and that remains for some time. So this you, you get through calm abiding. So initially you alternate calm abiding and the analytical meditation apprehending emptiness because initially you are unable to operate them simultaneously. You can't be analyzing. So what you do is you do calm abiding and switch very quickly to analyzing. So your mind was still calm because of the, the calm abiding. You start analyzing and it grows disruptive. Then you go back to the calm abiding. The moment you, you notice it's disrupted, it's no longer it's no longer like a fish in the ocean, it's more like a shark or a whale, <laughs> right? <laughs> Disturbing the surface. You go back to calm abiding, letting go of emptiness. Going back to the breathing. So let's say you take the breathing. Going back to the breathing. Okay, the mind grows calm. 
When you have reached the calmness, you go to anal analysis. The mind is still calm, right? You analyze, you analyze, it grows coarser again. And you go back, alternating, back, forth, back, forth. Until you're actually able to keep that calmness, the calmness that comes from focusing on the breath, you retain that calmness, but you're still focusing on emptiness, which would usually disturb your mind. Like, disturb, not, like, not disturb as a negative disturb, but let, will not allow you to be as calm and focused. Okay, there'll be a sense of disruption. Until eventually, that calmness, the same calmness with which you focus your breathing, you can do that for four hours now, right? So you have calm abiding, of course I need to stress that. You now utilize emptiness and you can do that for four hours. Now when you have those two, that is called, when you have both, it's called a union of calm abiding and special insight, taking emptiness as the object. It's terribly long, but it makes sense. This one I know it has to be unbroken, the concentration. It has to be. Well, eventually it would be good, but even at the beginning it may be hard to have that as part of the process, right? Mm -hmm. But we, we'll talk. You'll have the chance to ask questions about that later. Sorry, I took one. That's no, not fair. Not. Is it, like, it has to be exactly four hours. <laughs> no, no. Three, three hours and 59 minutes, I'm pretty sure. This is just a rough measurement. This is just a rough measurement. I don't know. It's, it could be a little bit more, a little bit less. I don't know why it's four hours, actually. Okay. So, however, initially we have to alternate calm abiding and the analytical meditation apprehending emptiness since we're unable to operate them simultaneously. But with longer practice, we gradually cultivate a meditative stabilization that is a union of calm abiding and special insight and that realizes emptiness conceptually. Does that make sense? So the mind is so focused, so focused, so calm. You don't get exhausted for hours, wow, of that. No exhaustion. <laughs> okay. At this point, we must strive to attain a direct perception. So once you have that conceptual mind, the mind is now so focused, so calm, but you still you have to go via the, the um, meaning generality. It's still through that that you perceive emptiness. Now through concentration, you make that disappear and you have a direct experience. Okay? So again, no experience that we can compare that to, except for a sense perception, but that's already there. We don't have to meditate on that. And this is only where we rely on the great meditators who have had that experience. Okay. At this point, we must strive to attain a direct perception of emptiness that actually has the power to irreversibly eliminate ignorance, etc. So that's the kind of mind. This is like a high-powered vacuum cleaner. <laughs> right? Right? Oops. Yeah. So, hence we engage in even more meditation so that the generic image meaning generality, of the conceptual meditative stabilization that realizes emptiness eventually fades away and the conceptual mind transforms into your yogic direct perceiver. That's what the mind can do, actually. It's amazing what the mind can do through focus and concentration. So we have no experience of it because if you can't do for at least four hours or whatever, stay focused on the object, that direct perception is just not possible. But in these days, this day and age, it seems impossible because, of course, we are more disrupted than we used to be. Mm -hmm. But actually, when you read like the story of the Buddha and some of the stories of the great masters in the past, this was part of Indian culture. As in, like there were a lot of people, it was not required of everyone to live a family life, so when they became renunciates and they went off to, to become a spiritual person, they engaged in these incredible meditations where they could do the most amazing things. I mean, flying in the air... It's not. It's not a mis It's not like just made up, because you start to be able to control the energy in your body. If you can control the energy of your body. You can control well where you are right now. I mean, being able to walk over water. It's all over. There are lots of explanations how that works with your mind, because again, you start to control not just the energy in your body, but the one around you. It's with this very focused mind. So these special feats of being able to... I mean, even nowadays, some people can walk over fire and not get burnt because they focus on something specific. And again, the energy in our body is just as important as all the other parts in our body. And you can actually avoid being burnt 
if you focus your mind in a special way. So many of us believe that, or that you lie on a thing on, of nails, you know, like and you don't get your skin doesn't pierce. If I lie on that, I'll be gone. I'll be like a thief. Thief. <laughs> <laughs> but other people, they can do that, right? Um, so because of their level of concentration, <laughs> right? So therefore. These ideas, so it, these are just side effects. They're not even considered to be important. It may inspire other people to do those practices. That's not the main purpose, that you can control the environment around you. There are many stories, like even being able to make rain. Mm -hmm. There are all these stories of these lamas. Uh, I remember that one story, Lama Zubarimbaji made some rain, and it, it just it took a while, and there was no rain. And then at some point, there was just this cloud. It was just raining above. And his students were there, and there was just rain there. I mean, maybe it was a coincidence that just in that moment that rain cloud came. But there are lots of stories. There's so many stories. I told you these visa stories, you know? Like, um, there are other stories of... Well, never mind. I, I, I will, I will eventually. Yes, I will. But not when we have more time. I want to finish the material first. So there's so many stories, and you hear one and you don't believe it, but you're ten from different people who have no reason to lie to you, and then you have your own personal experience. You have your own experience. When a lama tells you something and you go, how do they know? How could they know? I've had these experiences, not many, but a very few, and I'm thinking, how can they know? Right? Again and again, just enough to keep me going, basically. Right? So that is the power of the mind. And so these abilities are usually used to benefit others. And then there's, it's not, not just in the Buddhist tradition. Like I said, in the non-Buddhist, in the Hindu tradition, there are lots of examples. In India, at some point, it was possible that a lot of people had, for instance, what's called photographic memory. Because when you have that type of calm abiding, you're so focused, you can remember even the whole teaching of the Buddha. So, for instance... Many of the disciples of the Buddha, when the Buddha taught, they had developed these deep states of concentration and they could remember, right? I can remember a sentence. I can. A sentence. That's how much I can. If I'm very distracted, I cannot. So the more, fo more focused I am, the more I remember, maybe a sentence or two. Now, some people, because of their deep level of concentration, could remember a whole teaching the Buddha gave. And later on, when it was written down, they said, thus has I once heard the Buddha say. That's why they started with, thus have I once heard. Right? And then someone wrote it down. Do, 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 right? And that's how you, how those teachings were passed down to us. So it's, it's, it's not surprising. And there are many accounts in the past of great beings who had these incredible abilities to remember. Okay? So that's what I'm saying. We are a bit at a disadvantage because we really no longer have these abilities because we've lost it, basically. We're so dependent now on MP3 players and before that tape recorders and calculators, etc. We don't use our mind to that extent any longer. Google. Okay. <laughs> Google, yes. Do you want to take a break? Oh, sure. Should we take a break? Is it time to take a break? Okay, great. All right, so we take a break. It's 36, 15 minutes, 50. So 4.50. And again, you're welcome to come to ask questions. <clears throat> and we have half an hour question and answer anyway at 5.30 we'll start ah, alright so I said it before but not everyone was here uh, someone has actually said that this becomes very noisy in here so maybe we can try to make it a quiet zone and not talk in here so for those people who would like to be in silence and now outside is kind of a <laughs> silent zone but we only have four and a half days three left. Days. Three, three and a half days, days left. So those last three and a half days, to really try our very best to be silent. Okay, to really keep the silence. So to try one more time. Um, so including included in that is like not talk in here. Okay, if you need to discuss things, do it during discussion. Do it. Do it during discussion. Okay. <laughs> Do it during discussion. Okay. All right. And really try to keep the silence. Maybe if you want to talk about something, maybe write it down and then do it when there's the time to do so. Would that be? Would that make sense? Okay. Great. Mm, 
All right, so at this point, we must strive now to attain a direct perception of emptiness that actually has the power to irreversibly, irreversibly eliminate ignorance. Therefore, we engage in even more meditation so that the generic image fades away. I, wrote, I read that a bit already. And the conceptual mind transforms into a yogic direct perceiver. The yogic direct perceiver that directly realizes emptiness is the only awareness that can irreversibly eliminate all, other short, all our shortcomings. So it's like the vacuum cleaner. Therefore, every time it manifests, it eliminates one of the layers of the afflictive or cognitive obstructions. So it doesn't, it's also not always present. It's not always present. In fact, you need to take some time to absorb into it, to go into it. It's, it's not that easy because not, no conventional truth, nothing appears. It's just this absorption into emptiness and you remain in that probably for a few hours. And then you rise from it again. Okay? And every time you, you, your mind goes into that absorption, kind of goes, kind of like it's, when I say it goes into it, it's kind of like all the sense consciousnesses become awarenesses to which the object appears but is not ascertained. They're not at all cognizing anything. You're deeply absorbed. And, and I don't think anyone can easily get you out of there. You yourself can, of course. Um, you kind of set your mind to arise from it again, like I will do this until I eliminate such and such. And then you naturally arise from it at some point. So you eliminate these obstructions one after the other. So every time you arise, there's less anger, there's less attachment. They can no longer arise because whichever misperception gave rise to this type of anger, it's no longer there. So the different layers, the coarser layers that are easily removed. And there are those that are harder to be removed. So we, we distinguish, for instance, between coarser anger and subtler anger. Coarser types of anger is, for instance, the kind of anger that makes you strike out. We have like a, a coarser form that is so strong that it may motivate you to hit someone, even kill someone, but hit someone or, you know, in, in any way express your anger physically. But even when you get rid of that, you can have subtler forms. Right? You have a smile on your face, but you're boiling inside. <laughs> so that's a subtler form. A subtler in the sense harder to recognize. Maybe even for yourself harder to recognize. And so these afflictive emotions, they become subtler and subtler and subtler. You can no longer act upon your anger, for instance. No longer strong enough. And so slowly, step by step, you remove all of those. All the misperceptions that give rise to them, the coarser forms of anger. The stronger your sense of self, the stronger... <laughs> Oh, the stronger your sense of self, yes, the more likely, the, the more likely you are, um, the stronger your sense of self, the more likely you are to get angry if someone threatens yourself, for instance. Okay. So every time it manifests, it eliminates one of the layers of the afflictive. So you start with the afflictive, and if you want to eliminate the cognitive ones too, well, that is, you want to become a Buddha. So wishing to become a Buddha means that you wish to eliminate what's in the way to becoming a Buddha. Like you try, of course, wishing to become a Buddha means you need to understand what it means to be a Buddha. Just saying, oh, wouldn't it be nice to be a Buddha? Okay, from now on I want to be a Buddha. That's not Buddhicitta. There must be an understanding of what Buddhahood actually entails, to some degree. Not, we don't have an experience of it, of course, until we become Buddhas, we don't know. But to have a sense, that's what it means. That's what's in the way. That's what I want to remove. And that's how it can benefit others. Therefore, I wish for that, to attain that. This gradual process, process from a wrong consciousness to a yogic direct perceiver also applies to the realization of the lack of a permanent, partless, independent self. That's an example of, for instance, an, an intellectually acquired view of a cell that's permanent, partless, independent. That's a view, that's the Atman. Well, I don't know whether that's really the Atman, the way it's described in some of the non-Buddhist philosophies. At least at the time of the Buddha, there were some philosophers around, and there was this exchange between those who believed in such an Atman, and of course uh, the, the Buddha refuting this. So you come across a lot of debates in the scriptures. For instance, the text that I'm translating right now, and I'm also teaching, which is called the Pramanavatika, it's on logic. It uses again and again, it kind of mentions a person who's a follower of the Vaisheshika system, for instance, or of the 
uh, Lokayata system, like a philosophical system of, of materialists. And then there's this debate taking place. Now, people find that a little bit disturbing sometimes. They're saying, the Buddhists, they're putting down the Vaisheshikas, they're putting down the Lokayatas, because the Buddhists always win the debate. <laughs> um, but this is really important to understand that, that in India there was a beautiful tradition where people of different traditions, they live together. Sonne sometimes talks about it, that at the great Nalanda Buddhist University, Nagarjuna was part of this university, many of the 17, in fact the 17 banditas are all said to be Nalanda masters. They all took part in the, well, were all members of this incredible university. And so it wasn't just Buddhists living there. There were many different philosophers who wanted to understand their own system better by debating with the Buddhists. Right? So if you have someone to debate something with, you get to understand, you see the, the, the mis- maybe the, the contradictions in some of your own system and you can you know, work with them or your misunderstanding of some of the explanations. And it, it just helps us to get a better understanding. So this tradition of philo- like philosophy of debating with one another and then meditating on that, that was existent all over India. And um, His Holiness also often talks about it. There was respect for the other tradition but no faith in it, as in like faith as in like, um, I believe in this being the right kind of system for myself. So you don't have to have devotion for another system, but respect is necessary and understand it is important for others. So I don't need to believe in that myself, um, but I can still benefit from understanding it and I need to respect it. So in that way, a lot of non-Buddhist schools debated with the Buddhists and vice versa. And a lot of the texts, when they mention these, the non-Buddhist philosophers, it's not like any of the non-Buddhist philosophers reads the text. It is meant for Buddhists, only for Buddhists. Because some of the views that they hold are, from a Buddhist point of view, not in accordance with reality. And to identify those views within ourselves, they're formulated. They're formulated in a, in a way, like, for instance, the classic is like, right now, this text... That, well, we've just gone past it, like past and future lives, right? Now, the Lokayatas, they don't believe in past and future lives. They, they were one of uh, the philo- philosophical schools in India saying, there is no past and future lives because we can't see it. Right? We can't, we can't see it. I cannot see it, therefore it doesn't exist. Now, from a Buddhist point of view, that's not a correct reason. Of course, nowadays we know that because science has proven a lot of things that we cannot see with our senses but we can infer them to be true but for a lot of people they still don't believe they don't believe that there could be something like spirits spirit beings i haven't even mentioned those (laughs) but i truly believe that there are other forms of life that we cannot perceive i truly believe that i have no doubt in my mind I believe there's past and future lives. I believe our actions have consequences. And I believe there's so many beings around us that we cannot perceive. And they can affect us positively or negatively. Okay? Or not affect us all at not affect us at all if we're not vulnerable to this. So there are other forms of life. And a lot of people say, no, I don't believe in that because I don't see it. What? You don't believe in viruses because you don't see them? I mean, okay. There's of course you can see them on a on a you know, with a, with a microscope, for instance. Uh, can you? Can you? Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Then. <laughs> Whoops. God is the perfect example. We can't see him. Okay, God. <laughs> well, from a Buddhist point of view, God, as like a creator of rea- of cre- a creator God from a Buddhist point of view is a bit problematic. So from a Buddhist point of view, it... From Buddhist point of view, it doesn't make sense that there's a creator of our problems, etc. Right. Yeah. But just kind of divine beings, yes. From a Buddhist point of view, there are beings that are maybe similar to us, but experience great joy, and we cannot see them. Okay. So we, we I just had a talk with uh, with one of you, like talking about in some cultures you have what is called the evil eye. Mm-hmm. So interesting how pervasive that is. Mm-hmm. So pervasive. Um, you have it, the Tibetans believe in it, that there's some forces that could harm you. So you don't talk about future plans, for instance. I have a very good friend from Greece 
and uh, when, when I do something like she, she likes the way I translate it or something she says <laughs> <laughs> she spits on me three times she says that avoids any kind of harm the evil eye and I was like we don't have that and then I realized we do have it in Germany when someone sets out to do something we say toy 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 it's like toot 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 right so when someone does something to they, for good luck so, f- so to make sure that nothing comes into their way you say toy toy toy. That's actually I googled it. It means tu tu tu. You try to spit you, you spit on them three times. So it's really it's really pervasive in, in many, many cultures. And it comes I don't know where it originated from, but it's definitely based on the idea um, that you can be harmed, of course, by other human beings. So for instance, it, it often manifests itself. You don't talk about what you're planning to do. If you have some great plans, my Tibetan friends are hilarious. I have this really good friend who believes in it so much that she just recently went to Australia um, to help a, a lady there who she's good friends with. But it's always like you go abroad, so you keep it a secret. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I, I asked her, I was already in Israel, and I was like, could you do such and such? She's just like, yes, 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 yes. And then she's like, sorry, I can't do it. I'm leaving tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, I forgot. That's a possibility. You could leave any moment. <laughs> you wouldn't talk about it because of that whole, right? I, mean, I, I joke with her. I joke with her. I say, make jokes like, um, could you maybe tomorrow kind of give me a call? Oh, well, maybe you're in Australia tomorrow. How do I know? <laughs> so we joke about it now. But she keeps it a secret. She doesn't tell me. And she doesn't tell anyone. Not only the people she needs to know to get the visa, for instance. And then she goes because they, they see it like as an obstacle. Other people may be jealous or whatever, may harm you in that way. So I don't know whether that's always... It can be a superstition as in like, no one will harm you. It's not going to happen. But it can. I mean, sometimes we have big plans. Other people don't like it. And they may actually try to avoid you know, that happening. So that's a possibility. People may get jealous. You want to do something, and if they really dislike you, they could actually get into your way. But there's also this idea of other forces um, that can harm you. And oftentimes, you become vulnerable to other forces when you have a lot of fear, when you have a lot of doubt, fear and grief, I believe it is. And we have oftentimes fear of the future when something arises. So the sense you keep it secret not to attract these forces. I don't know whether we're really that vulnerable to them, but I, there are a lot of stories. There are a lot of stories um, from people who are. I tell you one small, a small story of this girl who was. Uh, she was harmed by what's called spirit harm. It's called like if you live in an area where there's strong belief in them, they become stronger because they. I don't know how to say it. Like in some areas, like in the Dak in Zanska, they actually believe very strongly in these spirits and they feed them. They, they kind of symbolically give them food, right? So I'm not sure they're really feeding them, but the point is they really believe in them and they create a strong connection to these beings and they can actually affect them. And so that is true also in other areas. So people are more receptive to be harmed by those beings. There's a way you can protect yourself from it. But in this case, it was a young girl who was really good in school. Really, really good. So she was doing really well and, and um, was supposed to finish high school. And then this spirit harm. There was some karmic connection with a being and it started harming her. Now, how do I know that? Because she moved in with her mother in the next building. And she looked really sweet. And her mother was also like very quiet, beautiful kind of person. And this girl was so hilarious. She would go out on the balcony and talk to the monks, like really using dirty words. Mm-hmm. Whenever a monk would pass, she'd be like, come on, let's fool around. I learned all these dirty words from her, like shouting all the time from the... I mean, the monks just thought it was hilarious. They walked past, past like Namgya Monastery monks, and her mom would always pull her in, like, come, 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 come inside. They were from Sikkim, but Tibetan. And they were waiting for his wholeness to come back. Mm-hmm to help her remove the spirit harm. And she was really like, she looked really, when she was calm, she looked 
very she looked very humble and her mom did too like like a shy person but then she had these these episodes just screaming out on the balcony and going crazy and especially with her monks you know every time like the two monks would walk past she would say the most hilarious things and we were all waiting for his holiness to come back and then finally his holiness came back right away they got an audience with his holiness and his holiness, so she told the Tibetans around, the mother did, did something with her and, she, and said that was spirit harm. And I saw her the next day. They were there for another week. She never did any of that again. She was very quiet. She didn't remember any of what she had done, right? So this was, I don't know. I mean, she was not taking, I don't know whether she took medicine and so forth, but I don't think so. They were just waiting for his holiness. And his holiness did some ritual and she was okay, right? So... Around here, it's not so rare, you know, like no. often people go to Lamagipala and then they go to Namgyal uh, Monastery. Yes, yes. So you see it? Yes, it's quite, it's quite natural. Yes, I remember I used to live in a building next door. It's called Elysium House. It's no longer part of, it's, you can no longer live there. It's part of the Vipassana Center now. And it belonged to a German lady called, ah, I forgot her name, Leah, Lisa or Leah. Anyway, she was elderly and she bought the property in 1970 when it was very cheap for like $20,000 or something. Beautiful property, old British house. And she told me the stories. And like I lived in that building. I had a room and as part of the property. And of course she was German. And my father once came to visit and my father and her became good friends. So he told her, she told us all these stories. We were sitting on the balcony and she talked about how his homeless would pass by and have a tea on her balcony. Those were the days. You know, all these high lamas that lived all over. There were no tourists here, only Tibetans, like newcomers. His homeless wasn't known in the world. I mean, only by the Tibetans, but there were not that many Tibetans and so forth. Anyway, so, and she also talked about one room in that building that they could never warm it up and that she had a tiny dog and it wouldn't go in there. And a lot of the local children here, Kata, who's the driver, who, he was very close to her. His brother Ashok and Kata, they grew up and she took care of them. So many of the local children would go there and play there and say they would see a woman. They saw a woman. So there was just this lady, like a kind of white kind of transparent kind of woman. They, they would see this woman and they would always talk about it. Anyway. But they, she didn't know what to do with this room because no one wanted to stay there. It freaked them out. It was always cold. The dog wouldn't go in there. So one day she asked Ling Rinpoche, his homeless um, teacher, personal teacher, to come over with a translator. She explained, um, well, there's this room. I don't know what to do. And he said he'll meditate on it or he'll, he'll kind of make an observation. And then she reported back. He reported back. He said, he asked, I think, I think that's how it went, like, did someone die in this building? And she said, yes, this building was destroyed during the 1905. There was a huge earthquake here that flattened the whole area. 20,000 people died and the rest left. That's why the British left from here, because they were mostly killed. So this huge earthquake, uh, I think 8 point whatever on the Richter scale. So a lot of buildings were destroyed and this building was too. And the whole family was killed. The whole family was killed. So mother, father, they were British and their two children. So Ning she said, oh, that explains it. And he did this observation. He said the mother died, but she had really strong, they all died, but she had such strong attachment. While she was dying, she was like, her strong attachment was responsible for her being reborn as like a spirit being, like being attached to the house. And she couldn't let go. She wasn't harming anyone. She was just scaring people. So, and the dog picked up on it, and the children in the village picked up on it. Anyway, so he said, I can do something about that. And he went in there and he did certain pujas. They do these pujas. What they do is they, they are responsible for the spirit being dying and basically passing on. And Leah, she's Leah, her name was Leah. Leah did not really believe in that, you know, but she said, I don't know how it worked. But the moment the puja was over, the dog ran in. <laughs> no one ever saw, had any sighting of the spirit. And you could warm it up. Mm. Right? Whatever happened, it worked. So I, why not? There was these spirit beings. I mean, we grow up like Santa Claus uh, and spirit beings. You know, it's a sign of maturity that we no longer believe in ghosts, right? But I mean, this is like the exaggerated version. Like, there's just other beings around us. They're all around us. And they can harm us. They can benefit us. And what is the best way to protect yourself? Very easy. Love and compassion.
You can actually, if you generate love towards all beings, even both spirit beings, you would never harm anyone if, 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 if they really loved you, right? So love protects, protects you from anything. This is why the Tibetans always say, generate love, generate compassion. When you feel there's some force that harms, just generate deep love for them. It's a huge protection. A lot of people advise against not sharing spiritual experiences and practices. Very good. A lot of people also advise us not to talk about their spiritual experiences. Again, it could attract uh, obstacles. Of course, our own ego could get big, bigger. Of course, you may only share it. Anyway, we shouldn't talk about it. Um, you should keep it secret if you have any spiritual experience. Only talk maybe with your teacher about it. And you, you've noticed that people don't boast, 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 boast with their spiritual attainments. In fact, we're jokingly saying, if someone says, I'm enlightened, you know they're not enlightened. <laughs> you know for sure. Someone comes along, I'm a Buddha. Right? So, I mean, the Buddha is said to have said to some of his disciples, I'm the enlightened one. But he, only, he didn't say it to boast. He just said it, look. Trust me, this is the situation. So you can, of course, with your... <laughs> you can, of course, talk to your teacher and say, look, I've had that understanding. Your teacher may, in fact, ask you, you know, what's your realization? I'm not even sure that whatever you said it, in, in, but you may have said to a person who's doubted it and kind of kind of said, look, I did I realize such and such and such. And, of course, not he didn't just say it, but also manifested or explained his knowledge. But the point is usually you never talk about it. That's why his holiness never says he's special. He says, I'm just a normal monk. But if you pay attention during the teachings, he sometimes says things. He says, well, I actually had a sense of what selflessness is. When I was about 18, da 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 you know, and like I had a really strong sense of bodhicitta. That is helpful. It's not, he's not boasting. He's just saying, look, this practice has been effective for me. And if you really listen, and usually the translator does translate that. I mean, it's not everything you can translate, but usually that comes across because it inspires us. But then when you ask, like, are you special? No, 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 I'm just, you know. So to inspire us when it's necessary to hear that you can generate love and etc. you may talk about it, but never to boast, never to, you know. So in that sense, it's always good to keep things silent about your own success, don't talk about it. You don't need to talk about your success unless it inspires other people, unless you feel it could encourage another person to do the same, not to, 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 to show off. That attracts obstacles. It attracts jealousy. It attracts, and it may even attract these forces. Now, I don't think, but you see like Lama Yeshe and Lama Zubarimbushe, when they went to the West for the first time and Lama Zubrimji and Lama Yeshe, they have special abilities. I have no doubt. The things that Rinpoche told me at times, I was like, how does he know? I mean, it's incredible. Anyway, so and Lama Yeshe is known to have these abilities too. And Lama, Lama Zubrimji doesn't sleep. I told you before, he really doesn't sleep. And you can't pretend you're not tired if you just talk the whole night through and you continue the whole next day. So therefore, Lama Zubrimji and Lama Yeshe, when they passed, went to, to the West, and they went to a hospital, um, what do you call that, like a hospital for people who have mental problems, what do you call that? Yeah. Psychiatric. Yeah. A psychiatric hospital. And they said, a lot of people here actually experience spirit harm. It's not just, there are, there are already, of course, some problems there, but when they hear voices, they may actually hear voices that we just don't hear because there is a being that they can connect with. But it's not as simple as that. You cannot, oftentimes you cannot just remove the spirit. There's other factors that make them vulnerable to that. I totally believe that there's so much more. There's the food we eat, there's our upbringing, there's the DNA we have, there's the karma we accumulated, and there are other beings around us. So to say, it's not there because I don't see it, that's like the Lokayatas. That's just, like, uh, just before you left, Twice he blessed the dog that just died. Yeah. So like he took very, very, you know, he saw the dog that was the last time. So he blessed the dog twice. He never does that. You know, that time. Mm -hmm. Did it? The dog was there three weeks after. You know? This is the same story, a similar story with Mr. Noroji. Mr. Noroji, who was responsible for the Tibetans coming here. You remember I told you? So he was very close to his holiness. Um, he 
usually he, he didn't have audiences with his holiness. He, he's actually following the Parsi. He's a Parsi person from the Parsi. I can never say that. So Rustian, the so Rustian faith. So Rustian, who's that actually came they actually came from Persia. So there was a small community from Bombay and he moved up with his wife to live here. Anyway, so he was responsible for calling his holiness and he was already quite elderly and when he was in his eighties, one day his holiness arrived back from a visit abroad. Now, usually his homeless likes to take the shortcut because his homeless is very busy. He takes the road from Lower Dharamsala, the shortcut up to McLaughlin's. But that day, his bodyguards reported he insisted they take the long turn, right? No one really knew why, but he took the long turn, <coughs> turn long road. And at the top of the road, Mr. Noroji, who lives at the very end of that road, well, used to have his shop there, still there, the shop is closed up now, he went heard that his homeless was coming and he went outside to pay his respects. He wouldn't have gone all the way down because he had to be in the store. But he went outside, his homeless stopped the car and he gave him a very special blessing. He talked to him, you know, he, he so people had the sense he did that for Mr. Noroji. That night he died. Wow. So I don't think his homeless killed him. <laughs> so the thing is, right? How did his homeless know? Right? With that was a priority. It was that last time. And before our director died, on that day he had an audience with his homeless. Right? Doesn't get audiences. He had an audience. He was called to, 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 to his homeless. He was called. And that night he died. So there are many stories like that that they know in advance. Right? And so many stories. Amazing. Um, anyway. If I have time, I'll tell you more. But that's what I'm saying. I'm saying here, the Buddhists, they debate with the Lokayatas, okay, in those scriptures, but they're not really debating with Lokayatas. They're saying, are you thinking like that? It doesn't exist because you don't see it. Really think your reasons. Why do you not believe in other forms of life? It's only one reason, because you cannot see. Right? Science haven't proved, scientists haven't proven it yet. That's ridiculous. That's like someone saying... 500 years ago, I don't believe in the round earth because scientists haven't, haven't proven it yet, or whatever, or not something better example. I don't believe in the existence of atoms because scientists haven't proven their existence yet. How do we know in 50 years from now, maybe scientists have proven that there are these other beings, spirit beings. Maybe they've proven it by that. So just because they haven't proven it yet doesn't mean it doesn't exist because scientists, science is evolving more and more. Their knowledge is increasing. So just saying... Scientists haven't proven it yet. It's not a good reason. So again, like I'm telling you, we're using a lot of reasons that are not correct reasons. It doesn't exist because I don't... No one else believes in it. It's not a good reason. It doesn't exist because I can't see it. Not a good reason. It doesn't exist because it's not part of my culture. It doesn't. It's not a good reason. So there are other reasons. Why could there not other forms of... We have other forms of life around us. Why only humans and, and animals? I mean, so many different forms. If you learn more about the mind, the mind manifests in different forms, in different ways. Okay, anyway. Sorry, it is a little bit off topic again, I know. But it completes that a little bit. Also, when you hear about other realms, it's not saying that they're like totally independent, objective realms, just as our existence is subjective. And our experiences are, so are the experiences of other forms of life. And sometimes they can affect us. Okay. So, please note that with regard to the realization of manifest phenomena such as the five sense objects, oh sorry, no, this gradual process from a wrong consciousness to a yogic direct perceiver also applies to the realization of the lack of a permanent part, partless independent self, of the 16 aspects of the Four Noble Truth, so in other words, the Four Noble Truth and their different characteristics, and so forth. So there are many, many things that you can realize directly that you may have to, or not that many, but you need to realize the, the existence of the Four Noble Truth, and more importantly, like settle in permanent emptiness. Right. Okay. Please note that with regard, in order to become enlightened, for instance, please note that with regard to the realization of manifest phenomena, such as the five sense objects, they are first realized directly by the sense consciousnesses and then conceptually with the mental consciousness. In the case of hidden phenomena, the process is reversed. For hidden phenomena are first realized conceptually and then directly with the yogic direct person. All right, now the last bit. Now comes the last bit. 
Well, except for, of course, in subtle minds. But other than that, now it's the mental factors. They're not difficult. They're no longer that difficult. So I'll start a little bit to make sure we have enough time. One of the most important classifications of the mind is the category of main minds and mental factors. This category is concerned with the functions and abilities of a single awareness. One awareness. So before we distinguished awareness as this category, that category, like there are minds that are direct, not direct, wrong, not wrong. Now any of those minds, we take one of them and look at their different functions. Okay? And what we explain now, in particular the beginning part, applies to any awareness. Every awareness has certain functions, basic functions, and those will be explained. Okay. And so these functions are called mental factors. Mental factors, the way you, when you hear this, it seems to suggest that there are five different minds. But it's actually just saying there are five functions that every mind has. And each function is given a name and is called a mental factor. Okay. Every consciousness consists of one main mind or one main function. So main mind just means a main aspect or a main function of a particular mind. That's called main mind. It's very confusing. Trust me, in Tibetan it's just as confusing. They call it a main mind. But really, to describe it, it would be the main function of a mind. So the main mind is just saying, say the I consciousness, from the point of view of its main function. For instance, before I, I took Alex, remember Alex? I used him as an example. So we can say Alex the person. That is the main mind. Alex, the person, whose main function is to be a, a human being, to be a, a person. And then he has these more specific functions. So he has the main function of being what? Well, a human being. That's like the main person or the main mind. And then he's a good student, he's a good cook, he's a good organizer, etc. Um, so all these other functions are there that, from the point of view of his... The ability to... Can you cook well? Oh, you can. Good. <laughs> okay, okay, great. You can make a meal for us. <laughs> so, so uh, having the ability to, to, to make being a good cook, there's Alex, the good cook. There's one function he has. And then there's the ability, you know, to, to know the Dharma or to study the Dharma effectively. So he's a good student. So these are all aspects of Alex, and we can discuss them separately. Okay? There's the main function of him being a human being, but then there are all these other ones. Does that make sense? So that's what we mean, really. It's just formulated in a, in a slightly odd way. Every consciousness consists of one main mind, one main function, and various mental factors, or mental, various mental uh, other functions, so secondary functions. If you like. Main minds are traditionally divided into six types. Surely, the five sense consciousnesses and the mental consciousness. So you can also into two, all the other different. But yeah, then usually they take that division because there's the main eye consciousness. So the eye consciousness that has the main function of just <coughs> perceiving its object. What is the main function the mind has? To apprehend its object. That's the main function. Okay? So from that point of view, from the point of view of that function, we describe a mind as a main mind. Even though mental factors can also be divided into those six types, they are traditionally, so we can also say the mental factors of an eye consciousness, an ear consciousness, etc. You can divide it that way, but traditionally they divide it even further. They divide the mental factors, the mental functions, they kind of point out 51 types of mental functions. That's ridiculous, there are thousands of mental functions. But if you understand those 51 and they were set forth by one of those 17 banditas, a sangha. Vasubandhu also talked about the mental factors, but the 51 were actually from a sangha. The two half-brothers, Vasubandhu and Asanga. So this is based on a sangha's explanation. So since it makes sense, it's a beautiful explanation. 51 is not really like you probably, we would have probably chosen 50 instead of 51. That seems a bit random. But, you know, he divided those categories, these functions in a certain way and it added up to 51. So we talk about 51 functions that the mind can perform, as in like there are five that it always performs 
And the other ones can be performed, but don't have to be performed. Because anger, for instance, performs a certain function that is different from compassion, for instance. So in that way, function. Okay. So there are 51 types. Mental factors can be divided into those six ty- into those six because they're mental factors that are eye consciousnesses, ear consciousnesses, and so forth. However, since mental factors refer to different mental functions, they're usually classified into 51 types of mental functions or mental factors. Is that clear? Does that make sense so far? Okay. Main minds are described as more passive and as their mental factor and their mental factor is more active. So it's kind of like a mind passive in the sense the mind just passively the mind passively just apprehends its object. It automatically. So passive kind of means automatically. Whereas the other factors, they're much more active. Okay? So the principal function of the main mind is to simply apprehend or be aware of the general entity of its object of engagement, while the principal function of the mental factors is to apprehend particular attributes of the same object. That's how it's usually said, but not just particular attributes, but also behave in a particular way to do certain things. And it becomes clear as we, once you see how the examples, this makes sense. Since every object has only one general entity, but many particular attributes, any one object has only one main mind, but many, many, many mental factors perceiving, perceiving it. There are several analogies that help to illustrate the relationship between a main mind and its mental factors. One analogy is that of a cabinet with a passive prime minister who's like the main mind and his, his active ministers, who are like the concomitant mental factors, concomitant as in like the associated. So, of course, a cabinet prime minister, like a prime minister as a separate entity, exists separate from the different ministers. Here is actually one mind and the functions are just... So they try to find analogies that sometimes can give us a wrong impression as if there were different minds. They're all of one entity. They're all of one nature. They're not separate. Like Alex the cook is not separate from Alex the person, but we can conceptually take kind of take Alex apart in that way. Although physically, that's of course not possible. So similarly, the mind cannot be separated in that way. But we talk about them separate just for the understanding of the mind. Another, the prime minister. Oh no, the prime minister merely performs the function of being there, whereas ministers are very busy performing different tasks actually not a prime minister, it's a king, but I chose a prime minister. Some of the ministers may be efficient, some sharp, some kind, some greedy, and so forth. And even though each minister performs a different function, the entire cabinet is influenced by every minister's unique activities. Right? All our minds are influenced by our anger, our attachment, our wisdom, and so forth. So if you think along these lines. Some liken the main mind to the flame of a candle and its mental factors to the rays of the candle. Just as the rays of the candle emanate from the flame and exist simultaneously with it, the mental factors come from the main mind and exist simultaneously with it. Just as every flame has many rays of light, every main mind has many mental factors. And just as the flame of the candle depends on its rays to illuminate its object, every main mind perceives its object in dependence on its mental factors. It's just, that's what's in the text. I just repeat what's in the text. You may find that helpful, I'm not sure. Another analogy is that of the palm of the hand and the fingers, where the palm is the base, but the fingers are responsible for the hand to function. Therefore, despite their different functions, a main mind... Okay, never mind, that's it, time is up. We have half an hour question and answer now. Okay, great. No, there were some people last time who raised their hand, okay, and then they see you be there. Yes. Maybe it was you, and it was Bao, and then I remember some people here in the center, but I don't know who, and Pianta, and you too. Go ahead, yes. So, uh, like, uh, relating to the dance of the and the uh, uh-huh. analysis and, yeah. and human yeah. So, how do we balance between how much dance writing you should achieve and how much... Well, the best way is to learn the Dharma to such a degree that you understand the real function and the need for calm abiding, the need for analysis, and then you know yourself. It's a little bit like when you do sports. The more you know about the sport and the effect it has on your mind and the goal for why you do it, the more you can balance the different exercises according to your needs. So you need to know about your own mind. You need to learn more about the Dharma. And then you know, how disruptive am I? Can I really 
focus on emptiness, etc. Well, I cannot, so I need to focus on calm abiding. And once you have more calm abiding, and trust me, that's not easy, but still, once you have more, more of a calmer mind, a more serene and concentrated mind, then also go back. So there's no, there's no one time, there's no one solution. Don't just get hung up on one. That would be like eating just one type of food. It needs to be balanced. But that balance, you can decide then. And of course, if you have a lama who's fully qualified, you can ask his or her advice too. Say, oh. So, uh, my broader concern is uh, not a concern, but a broader point mm -hmm. is that we, uh, we meaning all of us who are serious pursuers of Buddhist framework, mm -hmm. could and perhaps should be doing more to make Buddhist, Buddhist uh, worldview more accessible and intelligible to the world. Mm -hmm. And one important way to do that mm -hmm. is to respond to the developments in science, relevant developments in sciences, humanities, social sciences, and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And which is something that I greatly appreciate of, uh, about uh, his mm -hmm. It's very enthusiastic about that. Yes. Now, uh, you mentioned yesterday about karma and how free will is absolutely necessary for that. Now, please help me how I can respond to the following two points as regards free will. Free will? Yes. Now, the first is that when, when I mention about karma, when I mention about free will, the typical response I get is, uh, and it's uh, giving the exa uh, example that you mentioned yesterday, making a decision about lifting your hand and then lifting your hand. Mm -hmm. But what if someone says, if you look inside the body or the brain, mm -hmm. biological process of lifting the hand begins before you consciously make a decision to lift your hand, mm -hmm. which requires free will. Mm -hmm. And hence, the inference those people draw is mm -hmm. that there is no such thing as free will. Mm -hmm. Now, I do not know how I can respond, mm -hmm. or should respond to this. And the second thing about free will is there are people, and these are, again, hardcore researchers, they say, if you look at the criteria which we use to uh, say that a being has free will. Mm -hmm. So they look at these criteria mm -hmm. and they say that even the inanimate entities mm -hmm. right, inanimate entities yeah, inanimate entities could also be understood as fulfilling the same criteria. Of having so even mm -hmm. they could be understood as the, even they should be regarded as possessing free will. Now uh, hmm. Okay. Alright. First your first question is of whether we should kind of spread the Dharma well, only if there's interest. So the Dharma, in general, there's there's not the same emphasis on spreading the Dharma as you may find in Christianity, for instance, trying to convert people to Christianity. That is not emphasized because you can't convert someone unless they 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 benefit from the teachings, they find them convincing, they use reasoning to understand them, etc. So just to believe, to have blind faith in Buddhism doesn't serve any purpose. And it may uproot people, it may uproot people. Uh, so therefore, the only way would be, therefore, so, so that part is not part of Buddhism. So there's a lot of emphasis on not being like a missionary, as in like using that part. I'm not, I'm not saying that you said that, I'm just saying that is totally discouraged. But of course, if we feel that Buddhism serves a purpose in this world, and even if you don't need to become Buddhist, everyone knows that, and it, it's of great, it can be of great service that people take it on, I think by all means, if that is the motivation, I think it's great. I mean, mindfulness is one example that mindfulness, this idea has spread to the West, and now people take it on as a very effective method. They leave away the bits and pieces they find not helpful, and that's great. That's totally worth it in that sense. So yeah, likewise, if there are certain ideas you find helpful, and then combine them with um, with scientific ideas, but for that you have to really have a really good knowledge of Buddhism. So no, no, no wonder like monks and nuns, those who have a really good knowledge, study for seventeen years very intensely and and debate debate. So I'm not saying you need to do that, but I'm saying don't be satisfied. But to go deeper and get a further understanding as you go along. So to never get a sense, like even the Dalai Lama, he's a good example. He says every day he still reads the scriptures for four hours. His holiness still studies. He says, he st I still study. I read texts I haven't read before. His holiness makes a point, makes time, four hours every day as an example to us. 
still reading the scriptures. So if his wholeness does that, we should never be satisfied with our knowledge and continue on. And then, yes, bring it together with modern science. That's very good. Um, but of course, to be careful about are we using the same words? Is this different? Uh, does the meaning really refer to the same? Can this be? Sometimes we see parallels where they don't exist. So to be really careful in that. But I think it can be encouraged, should be encouraged. Now, with regard to free will, very interesting what you say, that there are some scientists that say there's the physical response before the mental. That I totally object to. And the great meditators, who actually are very aware of their mind, can probably, be, we're not aware of our mind. So what we can measure is the physical reaction in our brain. And because we've we measured that, and we don't have a strong, so that as a scientist, if I, I cannot measure another person's mental consciousness. So, of course, all, if I have a person I do an experiment on, all I can measure is their physical response, which leads people to uh, infer or reach people to the conclusion that, oh, there's only physical, and the mental, when they start moving, etc., only then the mental sets in. So... Actually, it would be important to have a meditator go through the same experience and measure the exact moment when there's a physical activity, but allow also the meditator to give the moment when a mental activity takes place. And in that moment, I'm pretty sure if, the, if, if this person is very self-aware, then the, there's first a mental process that then gives rise, I don't know, a nanosecond, whatever, later to a physical response. Because all the scriptures suggest that the brain is activated by the mental consciousness first. There's a moment of mental perception, and that gives rise to the, the what's called the, 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 the brain activity. And again, you know, the, the Wittgenstein example, just because it seems that way, it must be that way. The one thing we can see, therefore that's the cause. We can see the physical, that must be the cause. That's not a correct conclusion. And again, we need to investigate further. I'm not saying I cannot prove the Buddhist view. I don't even have any experience of it. And once I have an experience of it, if I do happen to have an experience, I cannot, I cannot convince you because you can't see my mind. So it's always an individual kind of situation. Going back to the free will, uh, uh, with regard to free will here, well, of course, from a Buddhist point of view, there is no type. It, it's actually the, the scientific view is very similar in that there's this, this cooperation between different minds, different parts of the brain, different bodily parts, and there's no central one that we can say is in control. There is no free will in the sense that there's one entity that controls the whole process. They're just different entities that work together nicely and based on having two options there, right? Like you could go right or you could go left. The person could theoretically take the right or the left. Okay? Based on that, we say the person has just made a choice. But the type of free will that we think of in the West that's based on Western philosophy is that totally independent I that makes a totally independent decision. Now, if there's no independent I and no independent person, that kind of free will is impossible. Okay? So that was the second question. And the third question, I forget. Oh, there was just that. Okay, great. Then there was no third one. Okay. Does that help a little bit? Okay. I'll discuss more with you later on. Okay, if we get the time. Okay. All right. Unless you want to come forward in the break. Sure. Yes. Um, wait, wait, wait. There was some more. There was some more over there. Yes. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. I touched on this very briefly a few years ago, but um, the idea that the brain starts going through the process of, of lifting the arm and then you have a gross conscious awareness of it. So, like, we also have the medulla which manages our breathing and everything. I think you mentioned before, there is a mind that controls that, mm -hmm. but we're not aware of it. Mm -hmm. So just because we're not consciously aware of lifting the arm until after these mental processes doesn't mean that there's not a mind mm. controlling it, right? The other part is that we do become gross consciously aware of it, and potentially it's free will as a matter of, like, the option for negation. So the option that, like, I'm lifting my arm, actually I don't want to do that, I'm going to hit something. And so there's still this element of free will, but it's in, like, the retrospective. So that could be a second. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, did you 
Raise your hand. Oh, no, I just had a comment on, on Yes, go ahead. Then. I wasn't sure you were kind of scratching yeah. your head and you were actually yeah. raising your hand. So, so the assumption, I think, from the side of these scientists is that the, the mind arises from the brain, mm-hmm. right, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. So their assumption is probably that the, so I say, nexus between the mind and the body, they always act the brain. Whereas, why isn't the, the mind could actually control the arm directly without going via? These nerves here. Mm-hmm. Why do we assume it always goes be in here? Mm-hmm. Right, that's what the scientists would assume that all this. Mechanism. Well, because there is always like whenever you there is some kind of activity happening, it does light up, as in like there is some activity or there's some chemical movement in the arm. Maybe it's not that it has to. Maybe it doesn't have to. Yeah, but maybe the you're mind right. Can directly control the arm. You're right. Maybe that could be researched. Right, so they, they, they mm-hmm. have the assumption that this is impossible right. because they think the mind exists in the brain. Right, yes. Dep- yes, okay. Yeah, I don't know. It needs to be researched further whether in every case it is truly the case that the brain has to be active. And of course, you see these, like, this is very difficult to prove for the Buddhists too. But on the other hand, the examples I like to use are, I remember like on the BBC there was once a lady, she talked about her experience, like where she had a near death experience. She was actually, her brain activity was gone. So she had had an accident, she was dead in that moment. And so the, 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 the ambulance worked on her and was able to revive her. But she was in this, in this brain dead situation for like, I don't know, 10 minutes, whatever. And then she was revived. And after she got better, um, she talked about she was aware the whole time. And as she got better or as she, was, as she recovered, she left the hospital and she asked to thank the people who helped her at the time of the accident. So they brought her to this room where all the ambulance workers were and only five or six, I don't know, whatever, were working on her at the time. And she recognized them. She said, you were there, you were there, you were there. And they were like, how do you know? She's like, I could see you. I watched you. I was there. I, could, I, I was conscious. So from a Buddhist point of view, it means the mind exists separately from the body. It can exist separately from the body, as in like from the brain. So even though there was no brain activity, but she was very vividly aware. It wasn't like a subtle, I mean, she was, she was, she said she was very much there. She was very attentive. And then the other factors are, of course, the boy who was born without a brain, his mental function was there and eventually his brain grew or the nuns who ha- had Alzheimer, but because of their mental training, it never got through. So there are other examples. I'm just giving the ones that I like the most. But there are lots of other examples that seem to imply that's a possibility. So I think it's good to look at that as a possibility. Because sometimes we have like a paradigm. We have like a ground foundation. And we try to explain everything from that view. Right? Just saying, okay, it's all the brain. And if you just insist on that, that's what it becomes. So I think it's good to be open the way you say it's just as another comment to, to what Peter said. Right? Okay, great. Okay, yes, this. Okay, it's with respect to the last part that yes. we just covered, the mind yes. and mental factors. So okay. uh, when we talk about main minds and divide them into six and all of them come with mental factors, yes. for me it's a little bit difficult because the, uh, when we talk about mental factors and we have the five omnipresent mental factors and amongst them, for example, is discrimination, etc. Mm-hmm. So I don't understand how, how the, the um, a main mind such as sense consciousness can have those five yeah, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Yep. Okay. <laughs> we we'll talk about that tomorrow. The, we haven't even talked about. I know, yeah. but because I. It's just Can you not sleep without it? <laughs> <laughs> I expe- I can't explain them now because okay, otherwise yeah, I have to explain yeah. it. So I hope you get a good night's sleep despite <laughs> that. <laughs> no, if you explain it tomorrow. Yes, I'll explain it tomorrow. I'll explain good, it tomorrow. Because yes. it's a bit strange. Yes, I get that. I understand what I think. I understand what you mean, and I'll address that tomorrow. Okay. okay. Yes. In the uh, like the steps cultivating a direct realization of emptiness, when you're at the inferential cognizer, mm-hmm. what's the sign? Like the way that smoke is a sign of fire, what would be the the sign that's not quite the direct realization, mm-hmm. but that's giving you the, the evidence of? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. You mean with the smoke and the fire, or a different example? With emptiness. Ah, with emptiness. Oh, good, good, good. What is the sign? What is the sign? What? 
<laughs> what, what, what indicates that phenomena cannot exist inherently? What do you think, all of you? There's no sign. <laughs> There's no sign. <laughs> the Buddha's just made it up. All right. What, what would, well, someone else. This, you, the fact that phenomena exist in dependence. Okay, that if things existed in and of themselves, it was inherent in you, it was just within you. I could find you being a woman was somehow in you. What's your name? Amanda. Amanda. So being Amanda, I feel there's this Amanda-ness. That's how, that's how you appear. It's not your head, it's not your face, it's not your voice. I have a sense there's an Amanda-ness, right? There's no Amanda-ness, really. Like, but I feel so in my mind. There is this Amanda-ness. I don't know whether if you have, for instance, a relative who maybe, like my father had a stroke 20 years ago, and he slightly changed, right? And now he's kind of like, initially he was not his own self. And I kept thinking, is a dad there in there somewhere? Right? As if there was dad in there. Now he's gone back to his old self. He's still paralyzed, but his mental, he's back. So, therefore, there's a sense there's an amendaness that's within you, right? But that would mean that's in you, and it's not dependent on me perceiving you. It's not dependent on me calling, saying Amanda every time you lift your arm. I say she lifts her arm. <coughs> there's a sense that Amanda's arm is lifted, and some invisible Amanda is also lift, lifting something. Or when Amanda is walking, instead of just me labeling Amanda walks on the basis of her legs walking, it seems like there's an invisible Amanda being picked up and walked along, right? That's how it feels. Now, if that Amanda really existed, you would not depend on my mind. You would not depend on anything. You'd just be there. So you couldn't be dependently risen, right? You couldn't be dependently risen. It would not depend on you being called Amanda. It would not be dependent on like being a female Amanda. It would not be in relation to your body. You just would be female, right? We sometimes identify very strongly, I'm a woman. I'm just a woman labeled on the basis that I have certain body parts that make me female. And a man is so on the basis of that or on certain hormones, etc. But there's nothing intrinsic in me that can be found that's a woman, Right? So if I really existed in that intrinsic way, I couldn't interact, I couldn't be impermanent. But of course, that needs to be understood, that relationship between interdependently existent versus lack of inherent existence. Because otherwise that reason is not effective. So this is an important factor. A correct reason doesn't have to be a correct reason for me. It has to, I have to become ready in the sense, like, for instance, in mathematics, there are a lot of correct reasons that establish this, that, and the other. You tell that to me, and I'm like, oh, I don't even know what the basis is. You see, like, a correct reason is usually formulated A is B because it's C. I don't need to know what C is. I don't need to know what B refers to, what A refers to, how C and B co uh, correlate, and how A and C correlate. Right? I need to know that relationship. So you can cite a correct reason, mathematical reason, if I don't have the basis, it's a correct reason for someone who has that basis. It's in general a correct reason, but not for me. So there's some groundwork that needs to be done. So a lot of scientific correct reasons, right? If, if we have no scientific background, they don't prove to me anything. I, you, you say that they give the mathematical proof of why the earth is round or what have you. And I go, all oh, right, never mind, I believe you. <laughs> Don't explain it further, I'm getting terribly bored. Right? So, so, therefore, if I s try to kind of now explain to you dependent arising, and like I have to give you a whole teaching on emptiness, and even I'm not a good candidate to do that. There should be actually someone who's realized emptiness giving you the explanation. Until your mind is so, you've really fully understood it, independence on someone who's really realized emptiness, then you've thought about it, you reflected on it, you meditated on it for a long period of time until you understand exactly what is that correlation between emptiness and interdependence and how are phenomena interdependent and how, therefore, since they're interdependent, they cannot exist inherently. Once you understand all that, then if I say... You don't exist inherently because you're interdependent. You go, oh, yeah, that makes total sense. But, you know, another way in the Prasangika school, 
When we say correct reason, that's actually not the whole story. Because they also talk about another form of reasoning that is very effective and highly necessary. Now, this is really not so much the place to discuss it. I haven't even mentioned it because otherwise I have to give you this huge explanation. And I won't give you all this. But there's another way of reasoning in the Prasangika that is not described as syllogisms, like A is B because it's C. That's in the, in the Greeks, we call that a syllogism. We use that word too. So A is B because it's C. But it's rather pointing out the absurdities. If phenomena existed inherently, what would be the absurdities? It would mean things don't change. It would mean things are independent. It would mean I couldn't interact with you. It wouldn't mean you need a consciousness to perceive something. It, wouldn't, it would mean that everything they tell you in physics about the light waves is not true. So you go through all these absurdities, really thinking about them, and at some point you realize... Pardon? So at some point you realize that doesn't make sense. Then no longer anything is possible. That leads you to the conclusion, no, it has to, it, it must be lacking inherent existence since it is interdependent, right? But you go through all these absurdities. Why? Because, you see, didn't I say before, when we get one aspect wrong, such as inherent existence, now we try to make it fit. And we, we, our logic oftentimes is so off keel. Is that a good word? Off keel? As in like, it's just a little bit too... So anything you're thinking about becomes extreme, right? It's all exaggerated. So because you can't help it, if phenomena... If I were the center of the universe, what would be all the consequences? You would have to recognize that, right? You would act accordingly. You would... Blah, 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 and I realize, but you don't. Therefore, how can I be the center of the universe? But I feel that way, and I expect you guys to act that way, and I get unhappy if you don't, etc., right? So there's this whole sense of expectations. I'm just exaggerating here. But for some people, that's true, right? So there's, there's these unrealistic expectations that lead to all these absurdities. Now, oftentimes, for us, it's easier to realize the absurdities, that they are absurd, and it's harder to understand emptiness as a result of that, as an example, right? But those indicate, they indicate it. And slowly, we come to the conclusion, oh my God, this world would be so upside down. In fact, nothing would be possible. And then we can come to that conclusion. So this is an extra type of reasoning that you find in the Prasangika, pointing out. They're called consequences. That's the word, consequences. It gives rise to this Consequent. The consequence of inherent existence would mean that everything exists independently. It would lead to that consequence. Tengyush. Telwa means like, like it follows. And tell also has the connotation of extreme. It leads to this extreme and that extreme and this extreme. That's a very powerful way of reasoning. Right? And it can be more convincing than saying A is B because of C. Rather say if A were the opposite of B then it could not be C, it could not be D, it could not be E, until you go, oh my God, no, no, that's too absurd. And you can let it go. And then come to a correct conclusion. So the type of reasoning here, as simplified, as simple as it's suggested to be here in the text, it unfortunately is not. So you really go through all these reasoning. You think about them, you reflect upon them, until at some point all these different reasons lead you to the conclusion, oh, A is B. In other words, A being you, B being the lack of inherent existence of you, right? That's how we get there. Does that make sense? Is that Nagarjuna's negation theory as well? Pardon? Like Nagarjuna came up with this negation theory where you negate everything and then you end up with one. Well, it's like the negation theory, it's, it's not in contradiction to what I just said. It's kind of like you come to the conclusion that this is an absurdity, cannot be that. You come to the conclusion, this is an absurdity, cannot be that. So basically you're negating all these absurdities and then in the end to negate the greatest absurdity, that's what you're trying to, right? So it's really just to say it in a different way. By understanding these absurdities and understanding those are impossible, you come to the conclusion that the deepest absurdity, which is lack of inherent existence, that, or that is inherent existence, the absurdity of inherent existence, that is also not possible. So it's just putting it in a slightly different way. 
right? It's not this, it's not that, it's not this. So if the person existed, the person would either be different from the aggregate. Sometimes there's different options. You go through all the different options. But all of that would be absurd. If I existed inherently, if there was a real self, the way it appears to me, either that self would be one with the aggregates or separate. And both are absurd. So you negate all these possibilities and there's not, nothing you're left with. So inherent existent or separate I, it's just impossible. Right? So in a sense, you're actually using, the, you negate the absurdities in order to eventually negate what you're trying to actually come to, like the object, actual object of negation. Does that make sense? Great. Three more minutes. Who's got a three-minute question? Okay, you. You ask. Well, by the way, yeah. Uh, Arya and Arhat. Ah, uh, what's the difference Arya. between an Arya and an Arhat? Okay. And I have one question. But let's first see whether three minutes... <laughs> I figured. So an Arya is someone who's realized emptiness directly, who's developed the antidote that enables you now to eliminate what's in the way to become an Arhat or a Buddha. An Arhat is just a person who's a limit, who's took, taking out the, the, the garbage. No, the, the garlic. garlic. <laughs> taking out the gar- garlic, yes. An Arhat is someone who's removed the garlic from the vessel. In other words, has removed the mis- misapprehension of reality, ignorance, and now has no longer afflictive emotions, but can still have, can still have uh, the cognitive obscurations that is what is still left uh, what obscures the person from being a fully enlightened Buddha. That's the Arhat? Okay. That's the Arhat. That's the Arhat. So a person, but even the Buddha is an Arhat, right? The, the Buddha has, of course, removed. The Buddha is always an Arhat, and Arhat doesn't have to be a Buddha. An Arhat is someone who's attained nirvana, liberation, has removed the garlic, and maybe even more. An Arya is someone who's only just found the tool, the vacuum cleaner, who's realized emptiness directly, that person, the moment you realize empty strictly, you are an Arya, but you don't have to be an Arhat yet. So first you become an Arya, then you become an Arhat, then you become a Buddha. But a Buddha is necessarily an Arya, a Buddha is necessarily an Arhat. An Arhat is not necessarily a Buddha, but is necessarily an Arya. Mm-hmm. And an Arya is not necessarily Buddha nor an Arhat. Okay? It's just part of the... And you were, well, I, 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 I try to make time so we go... And, and do the last bit from 20, page 25, I believe, to 32, and then hopefully it becomes clearer. I explain the stages of the path just briefly, and I use those words, Arya Ahat. But just for now, yes. What's the next bit? One minute. Uh, the, the story about the dog perceiving the spirit. The dog and the spirit. What oh. could we infer about dog sense from that? I don't know about dogs. I mean, dogs pick up on things like I've heard, like smell. Maybe they have a smell. Spirits have a smell we can't, right? I mean, dogs, they sometimes know when a person has a, a seizure. Like before they have a seizure, they, I've heard that they know the person's going to have a seizure. So they, they, the owners, they're just so trained that they pick up on the chemicals that are released and they pull the person down so that they're not standing and hitting themselves. So the moment the seizure is approaching, the person doesn't know yet in the middle of a crossroad or whatever, the dog pulls them away from danger, so kind of warning them. So dogs have an incredible smell. So we cannot see those spirit beings, I mean, obviously, but maybe there's a certain chemical, there's an energy they release, there's actually a smell, but we cannot perceive it. And dogs can. Dogs can see so many things we cannot perceive. Animals can perceive earthquakes. Before. Oh, earthquakes. Yeah. There's, there's some evidence for dogs knowing about an earthquake. So that's probably not a smell, it's more like a tremor, like a... Vibration. Right? A vibration, vibration, exactly. So they can pick up on that. So it's a lot of things. Their senses just work better. Mm-hmm. So in the case of like certain beings, they may pick up on that. We just cannot. So animals can help us. So dolphins with the echoes and, and what else? What are these animals? These tsitsikambo? Bats. 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 The Tibetans call them tsitsikambo. <laughs> tsitsikambo, like dr- dry mouse. <laughs> like one dried up mouse. <laughs> tsitsikambo, so yeah, bats. Anyway, all right, great. It's six o'clock. Um, I'll see you again tomorrow. So I think we can now do until six. We can go until six. Are you ready? Okay, great. So tomorrow again until six. Uh, and please try and keep the silence. Be focused as much as you can. So the last few days, and to try and make the most out of it. Okay, great. Have a great evening.